Welcome to the Transfer of Public Lands Movement Educational Study by the League of Women Voters of Grand County for the League of Women Voters of Utah. Utah is currently at the epicenter of an organized effort to transfer the public lands owned by all Americans into state ownership that could then be a model for other states to follow. The Transfer of Public Lands Movement study explores how the U.S. public lands came to be, their significance to the American public, and the consequences to the future of these lands and public access to them if the Transfer of Public Lands Movement succeeds. To better understand the organized attempt by transfer proponents to develop a narrative supporting their claims, this study also examines the actions being advanced by those who would claim state ownership of U.S. public lands. U.S. public lands came into existence as a critical compromise, allowing the original Articles of Confederation to be transformed into the U.S. Constitution. The public domain once stretched from the Appalachian Mountains to the Pacific Ocean. Of the 1.8 billion acres of public land acquired by the United States, two-thirds went to individuals, corporations, and the states. What remained has been set aside for national forests, wildlife refuges, national parks and monuments, Bureau of Land Management lands, and other public purposes. These lands provide timber, minerals, hydrocarbons, rangelands, water resource protection, wildlife habitat, carbon sequestration, recreation, and solace for citizens and visitors from around the world. This study is divided into two parts. The first part covers the question of who owns U.S. public lands and how that ownership evolved. The different management mandates between U.S. public lands and lands owned by the state of Utah and the visitation and economics of U.S. public lands. Part two examines the impact of anti-public lands rhetoric and the legislative history and development of a pro-transfer narrative intended to inform public opinion, support legislative actions, and influence courts. This presentation will end with study questions for league members and take action activities to jumpstart a state and national conversation about the future of public lands. We begin with ownership because who owns U.S. public lands is at the heart of the transfer movement's argument to return these lands to their rightful owners. The preamble to the U.S. Constitution begins with the words, we the people. Since we the people elect our representatives to Congress, and the property clause of the U.S. Constitution states, the Congress shall have power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States. We, the people, own the U.S. public lands. Currently, approximately 640 million acres of surface land are managed by the federal government, accounting for nearly 28% of the 2.3 billion acres of land in the 50 states and District of Columbia. Four federal land management agencies administer 608 million acres, 95% of these federal lands. They include the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Forest Service, the National Park Service, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Most of these lands are in the West, where the percentage of U.S. ownership is significantly higher than elsewhere in the nation. The remaining federal acreage is managed by several other agencies, including the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Department of Defense. What became the United States of America was inhabited by indigenous populations with land use practices that were already thousands of years old when Europeans arrived. European powers obtained land title via conquest over American Indians. In the Eastern United States, the 13 original colonies then obtained title from Great Britain following the Revolutionary War. Throughout the history of this country, the United States government has developed policies for acquisition, disposition, and retention of its public lands. The first public lands were created in 1781 when New York agreed to surrender to the federal government its claim to unsettled territory extending westward to the Mississippi River. The other colonies followed New York's lead and by 1802, all territory west of the original 13 colonies from the Appalachian Mountains to the Mississippi River became public domain lands owned by the federal government. West of the Mississippi River, lands were primarily acquired by the U.S. government from foreign governments, beginning with the Louisiana Purchase from France in 1803 and continuing through treaties with Great Britain and Spain in 1817 and 1819. Other substantial acquisitions through purchases and treaties occurred between 1846 and 1853, 
and included the Oregon country and the Mexican session lands, which comprise the land that makes up all or parts of present day Arizona, California, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. In 1812, Congress established the General Land Office, GLO, to administer the public lands with the primary purpose of passing public lands into private ownership. By the middle of the 19th century, most of the accessible land east of the Mississippi River had been settled and developed. As of 1905, there were still almost 450 million acres of the United States that remained unreserved and open to settlement. Of these acres, over 418 million acres were in the 11 contiguous Western states. The lands that remained were the most difficult from which to earn a living as settlers selected the best and most valuable lands first. As a rain chart from 1872 clearly shows, except for some land offering timber or pasturage, the far greater part of the land west of the 100th meridian was essentially not farmable because it could not support conventional agriculture requiring at least 20 inches of annual rain or irrigation. That is why there's a marked difference between the amount of public lands found in the eastern and central states and those found in the western states. While most of the accessible land east of the Mississippi River had been settled and developed by the mid 19th century, the land to the west was largely unaltered by Western European influence until the first Mormon pioneers entered the Salt Lake Valley in 1847. At that time, the area was claimed by Mexico. The boundaries of the territory of Utah established after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo following the war with Mexico in 1848 included much of what comprises the state of Nevada, all of the western third of today's state of Colorado, and a small corner of what became the state of Wyoming. Between 1868 and 1896, Utah petitioned several times to become a state, and on January 4, 1896, it was finally admitted into the Union as the 45th state. As part of the Utah Statehood Enabling Act, as well as part of the Utah Constitution, Utah proclaimed that the people inhabiting said proposed state do agree and declare that they forever disclaim all right and title to the unappropriated public lands lying within the boundaries thereof. According to information at the Utah Division of Archives and Record Service, whose purpose is to assist Utah government agencies in the effective management of their records and to provide quality access to public information, all land in Utah became part of the public domain when the United States signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. This land came into the possession of the United States government with a clear and undisputed title. No state contested title and no private rights had been established previously. Therefore, every original land title in Utah can be traced to a patent or other document transferring that land from the federal government. Thus, in 1896, Utah entered the Union as a state with over 70% of its public land owned by the federal or state government. The Bureau of Land Management is the primary land administrator overseeing 42% of the land area in the state. The US Forest Service manages about 15% of the land. The National Park Service manages 3.9% and the Fish and Wildlife Service administers less than 1% of the state. At statehood, trust lands totaled over 7.4 million acres. Since 1896, more than one half of the original trust lands have been sold. Presently, the Utah School and Institutional Trust Lands Administration, SITLA, manages over 3.4 million acres of land, or 6.3% of the state. State sovereign lands in Utah are classified as the lands that lie below the ordinary high water mark of navigable bodies of water. They encompass over 1.45 million acres of land and cover 2.7% of the land area in Utah. In addition to acquiring public lands and disposing of public lands, federal policy also includes retaining public lands and reserving them for the use of the American people. Public lands, whether under the General Land Office created in 1812 or since 1946 under the Bureau of Land Management are the lands from which our iconic public spaces are carved. U.S. public lands in Utah include national forests, national parks, national monuments, wildlife refuges, recreation areas, wilderness areas, recreation trails, historic sites, 
scenic byways, and national conservation areas. One of the most important methods of reclassifying the purpose of a given piece of public land is the Antiquities Act. The Antiquities Act was enacted in 1906 under President Teddy Roosevelt in response to the destruction of prehistoric ruins and other archeological sites in the Western United States. The act authorizes the president to declare by public proclamation, historic landmarks, historic and prehistoric structures and other objects of historic or scientific interest located on federal land as national monuments. It also authorizes the president to reserve parcels of land surrounding these objects, but limits the size of such reservations to the smallest area compatible with the proper care and management of the objects to be protected. Though the Antiquities Act was enacted with a primary goal of preserving archeological sites, it has also been frequently used to protect naturally occurring objects, such as the geological features within the Grand Canyon National Monument established in 1908 by presidential proclamation. Like the Grand Canyon National Monument that became a national park in 1919 through an act of Congress, Utah's Zion National Park began as a national monument set aside in 1909 under authority of the Antiquities Act. Zion became a national park in 1919. In 1937, Colob Canyon was proclaimed a national monument and in 1956 was added to Zion National Park through an act of Congress. The other three national parks in Utah that began as national monuments are Bryce Canyon National Park, established as a national monument in 1924 after the governor of Utah and the Utah legislature lobbied for national protection of the area. Arches National Park, established as a national monument in 1929, and Capitol Reef National Park, established as a national monument in 1937. The two newest national monuments in Utah, Grand Staircase Escalante and Bears Ears, are currently part of a legal battle over presidential use of the Antiquities Act to diminish the size of a national monument. While a president's authority to diminish a national monument has been questioned, there appears to be no dispute that Congress has authority to do so, a power it has exercised before. Utah government agencies, including the State of Utah School and Institutional Trust Lands Administration, the Utah Division of Forestry, Fire and State Lands, the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, and the Utah Division of State Parks and Recreation, correspondingly manage state trust lands, state sovereign lands, state wildlife reserves, and state parks. State lands comprise 10% of Utah. Unlike public lands, trust lands are not held in the public trust, Rather, they are held in trust for 12 public beneficiaries defined and designated by Congress at statehood. The Utah Constitution accepts sovereign lands to be held in trust for the people under the public trust doctrine and managed for the purposes for which the lands were acquired. Presently, the Division of Forestry, Fire and State Lands manages state sovereign land using multiple use and sustained yield principles. The Utah Division of Parks and Recreation manages Utah's 43 state parks heritage sites and museums, and is committed to enhancing the quality of life of all Utah residents by preserving and providing natural, cultural, and recreational resources for the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of this and future generations. In the 11 Western states of Arizona, California, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, Nevada, New Mexico, Oregon, Utah, Washington, and Wyoming, Outdoor recreation is responsible for $239 billion in consumer spending and nearly 2 million jobs, yielding over $75 billion in wages and salaries. Data shows that Americans and international travelers visit public lands in Western states more than 290 million times annually, making Western public lands one of the most popular destinations for recreation in the country. The West U.S. public lands saw four times as many visits as people who live in all of the 11 Western states combined. The number of annual visits to public lands in the United States continues to grow. In 2006, the National Park Service saw approximately 81 million visits to national parks in the 11 Western states. 11 years later, in 2017, the number of visits to national parks had ballooned to over 108 million. Similarly, visitation to the Bureau of Land Management's national monuments has nearly tripled since 2000. The data shows that in Utah, more than 28 million people visit public lands every year. 
Outdoor recreation contributes more than $12.3 billion to the economy, employs more than 110,000 people, and is the primary driver behind the tourism industry. Not only does Utah outdoor recreation create $737 million in state and local tax revenues, it is the reason for $3.9 billion in wages and salaries. Governor Herbert created Utah's Office of Outdoor Recreation in January 2013 as a result of the large contribution the industry plays in Utah's economy. The following figures are operations and management budget and costs underwritten by the federal government for the lands being targeted by the transfer of public lands movement legislation and do not include federal money expended on the National Park Service or the Fish and Wildlife Service lands in Utah, except for payment in lieu of taxes, PILT. The PILT program eligibility is reserved for local governments that contain non-taxable federal lands within their boundaries. These jurisdictions provide significant support for national parks, wildlife refuges, and recreation areas throughout the year. PILT seeks to compensate local governments for the inability to collect property taxes on federally owned land. In 2018, in excess of $400 million of federal funding was expended in the state of Utah in support of public lands. If the state acquires these lands, they will lose those federal funds and have to make up the difference with state funding or will have to sell those lands into private hands. If sold, it is highly unlikely the public would ever get them back. Utah's anti-public land rhetoric has already cost the state economically. After 20 years in Salt Lake City, the twice annual outdoor retailer trade show left Utah for Denver, Colorado. The move came after Utah Governor Gary Herbert refused to halt the state's efforts to transfer US public lands to Utah, nullify the Antiquities Act and undo Bears Ears National Monument. The trade show injected $45 million into Utah's economy each year. On March 23, 2012, Utah's Governor Gary Herbert signed into law House Bill 148, the Transfer of Public Lands Act, TPLA. The TPLA demands that the United States transfer title to federal public lands to Utah by December 31, 2014, turning approximately 30 million acres of federal public land and the resources they contain into state property. The public lands targeted by proponents of the transfer public lands movement are primarily Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Forest Service managed lands. But in Utah also include land under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Utah portion of the Glen Canyon National Recreation Area, which is part of the National Park Service. Following the Transfer of Public Lands Act, the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, enacted a model resolution demanding the conveyance of federal public lands to the states and both the Republican National Committee and National Association of Counties passed resolutions supporting public land transfers. Utah's efforts became a model for legislation that sprang up across the West and transfer theories were adopted as part of the Republican National Committee platform, including support for amending the Antiquities Act of 1906 to establish Congress's right to approve the designation of national monuments and to further require the approval of the state where a national monument is designated or a national park is proposed. The National Association of Counties resolution included criteria for the transfer, sale, or acquisition of public lands. Inspired by the prospect of local control, increased commodity production, and the revenue windfall that many assume a state takeover would bring, 10 of the 11 contiguous Western states had, by late 2015, entertained some form of transfer legislation. In addition to Utah, these states included Idaho, Montana, Nevada, Wyoming, Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, Oregon, and Washington. Even Georgia and South Carolina passed legislation in support of the transfer of public lands to the states. In 2019, Senator Mike Lee at a U.S. Senate subcommittee on public lands, forests, and mining roundtable held in Moab, Utah, stated the following. Not a single member of the Utah legislature or the U.S. Congress wants Utah to be anything but a public land state. Nobody in the state or federal legislature was looking to privatize Utah's public lands. However, in the Federalist Society January 2013 issue, the author of an article titled, 
a legal overview of Utah's HB 148, the Transfer of Public Lands Act, states, thus, if after the state gets the lands back, it decides to sell that property to private owners, the division of the proceeds will replicate the same division and school trust commitment that would exist according to the terms of the Utah Enabling Act had and as if the United States sold the property itself. And an undated American Lands Council Foundation publication contains the following. After the transfer, the goal is to ensure that everything you could do before, you will be able to do after the transfer, only better. Federal public lands will become state public lands. To understand the basis for these remarks, it is important to look at the history of transfer legislation in Utah. In the past decade, the Utah legislature has sponsored over 46 bills and at least 28 resolutions to help facilitate the transfer of public lands from federal to state government. While at the national level, Utah's elected representatives have been busy altering house rules and introducing legislation to facilitate the transfer of US public lands to the states. A partial list includes bills and resolutions dealing with eminent domain authority, federal transfer of public lands, public lands coordinating office amendments, interstate compact on transfer of public lands, and the Commission for Stewardship of Public Lands and Private Donations for Public Lands Litigation. To support transfer legislation, a number of reports, resolutions, and articles have been published. These documents cover everything from economic analysis to management expertise to alternative legal theories that Utah may use in court to attempt to gain ownership or control of the public lands within its borders all of which are discussed in this study. There are a number of papers directly rebutting the pro-transfer assertions in the documents listed in the previous slide. To understand both the pro-transfer legal arguments and the pro-public lands legal arguments, you will need to refer to the Transfer of Public Lands Movement Educational Study. In June, 2020, the League of Women Voters adopted a position on the transfer of federal public lands, which can be used by local and state leagues. It reads, the League believes that federal public land should benefit all Americans. The land should remain under the jurisdiction of the federal government with US Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management lands managed according to the multiple use sustained yield policy. We support improvements in management and regulation. The following study questions are meant to elicit further discussion after reading this study. Are Utah voters fully aware of the taxpayer dollars spent on this issue? What arguments can local leagues use to lobby their senators and representatives on this issue? What federal lands affect your community the most? Which organizations can the league partner with on this issue? In what ways can we support them? The Antiquities Act of 1906, used to create national monuments by presidential proclamation is also under assault by transfer proponents. Since four out of the five national parks in Utah began as national monuments, should the League of Women Voters Utah do a study to examine the impact of the Antiquities Act of 1906 on US public lands? Make retention of US public lands under federal ownership a priority for your league. The bulk of public lands owners and users live east of the Rocky Mountains and are completely unaware of what is happening. If we can raise awareness about this issue with other state and local leagues, and they can share the threat to public lands with their communities and elected officials, we can get ahead of the transfer narrative. Learn more about US public lands. Find out what public lands are in your state. Become an advocate for them. Partner with like-minded entities to raise awareness about the transfer movement. Contact your elected officials to discuss the transfer movement. Ask their position on transferring US public lands into state ownership and hold them accountable. I would like to thank the many readers who reviewed this study, and while I researched and wrote it, they shaped the contours of how the story was told. In addition, without the support of the League of Women Voters of Grand County and of Utah, along with the work of the League of Women Voters of New Mexico and the overwhelming support for public lands by the attendees at the 54th Biennial National Convention of the U.S. League of Women Voters, this study would not have been possible. In closing, I want to let you know about two amazing resources. The first is at sportsmansaccess.org, where you will find a short video on public lands, hand them over, 
In addition, the site provides public lands transfer fact sheets for nine Western states, each with excellent graphics and data, and a petition to sign to stop the transfer of our public lands. The coalition at Swartzman's Access is made up of public lands users that depend upon access to the national forests and BLM lands, which provide hunting and fishing opportunities to millions of Americans, and which are the envy of the world. The second resource I recommend is a new documentary from Patagonia Films called Public Trust, The Fight for America's Public Lands, which begins with the following quote. There is an enormous well-heeled movement to take lands away from the American people. If the case can't be made to protect those places, how can you expect to protect anything? To read the complete Transfer of Public Lands Movement educational study and find links to material referenced in this program, go to lwvutah.org and click on what we do in the top blue bar and select recent studies. Much of the narrative for this program is derived from the quotes of those authors highlighted in the study and listed under references. I wish to thank them for the use of their words. And thank you.